Hey there, this is Paula from the Afford Anything podcast, and the interview that you are about to hear is special bonus material that I recorded live on stereo. So if you want to hear my special live stereo interviews, head to stereo.com slash Paula Pant, download the app, follow me there, and you can listen to these interviews live. Now with that said, on to the show. Today I'm interviewing Rich Carey. He is a real estate investor who purchased 20 homes free and clear while he was in the military. So you want to talk about out-of-state investing? This guy was out-of-country investing. He was stationed in South Korea and buying rental properties in Alabama while he was stationed overseas. So he built a portfolio of 20 properties. And then after he retired from the military, after more than 20 years of service, he purchased another 10 more. Uh, So he's now up to 30 units. And in the upcoming interview, he talks about an offer that he may be receiving for all 30 of his units, a gigantic sale. So with that said, here's Rich Carey. Well, hey. Hello. Oh, look at that. We're live. Hey, how's it going? (laughs) Excellent. How are you? And I'm doing really, really good. (laughs) So you are in Hawaii right now. That is right. I'm in Hawaii. I'm like literally steps from the ocean. We're staying in some like beach cottages for a few days and uh, trying to get some surfing in. That's awesome. <laughs> well, I was going to say, what a cool little app. Uh, I'm looking at the uh, avatar of you. I have to admit I'm new to this, but it's it's really, really cool. I probably should, should have spent some more time on my avatar. Yours is so cool. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I spent, I spent a little too much time on mine. Like, <laughs> I, I tried, like, all of these different types of earrings. And, and at first I was like, maybe I need to make mine true to how I actually, like, you know, how I would normally accessorize and how I would normally right. dress. And then I was like, it's an avatar, have fun with it. Like, you know, wear a headband no, even cool. if you don't yeah, normally that's a great, wear one. It's a great bow. I see some good earrings. I don't know if those are pearls, but I have to admit, I don't think I've ever seen you wear that, but it looks great. Exactly. <laughs> that, my avatar is how I'm able to try on different different fashion. Yes. <laughs> so we uh, so I invited the uh, bu- the students in my course, your first rental property. I invited a bunch of them to come listen in on this conversation. So hopefully we've we've got some of those people here. Oh, that is awesome. I would uh, love to speak to that group of people. Uh, love real estate, you know, been been talking to you about real estate and even working with you on stuff. And uh, it's my favorite subject in the whole mer- in the whole world. Well, that and so- that and money in general, I guess. <laughs> um, tell me about what's going on with you and the. All right. So the last I heard, there was some guy in Montgomery who is like a serious Ooh. investor who knows the area. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And who off or is potentially interested in buying your entire portfolio of properties, all 30 of them. That's right. So cliffhanger, dun, dun, dun. As of five <laughs> days ago, as of I five know. days ago, he was interested in buying the yeah. portfolio of properties. What happened next? Wow. So, you know, I mean, this is something I wasn't expecting, but I think. I think that in this market, right, and as hot as it is, I guess you have to expect something like this. I wasn't planning on selling my portfolio. I wasn't talking about it with anybody. But there have been a few people who have approached me and said, you know, will you sell, will you sell? Well, this particular person, he knows the area where my properties are well. And all my properties are in Montgomery, Alabama. And I purchased them while I was in the military. I just retired from the military. This is sort of my, you know, fun retirement trip to Hawaii, just retired in August. But um, yeah, he he started investing the same time I did, and he was using the same method I was using, buying houses in the same neighborhoods, paying cash for them. Uh, m- most of my houses are paid off, and that that was also his strategy. And um, you know, he he moved around the world like I did because we we're both in the military. And at some point, he sold off his properties. He's been doing stuff in like stock market, and he has like a business. Basically, he came into tons of money, like, you know, a couple million dollars. And then he's been calling me up and saying, I've got to spend this money. I want to put it back into Montgomery. Will you sell me your portfolio? So that's like, that's kind of the quick story for everybody. And then you want me to continue from there? Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. So. Wait, so wait actually, b- before yeah. you continue, let me pause. 
uh, for a little more backstory. So how did you and he connect? How, like, how how is he aware oh. of you? Okay, so this goes back to me starting my investing journey uh, in Montgomery, mm -hmm. Alabama. Um, I've been in the, I was in the military for 20 years. Uh, I joined in 2000 and I just retired. And I had been trying to do real estate my entire career, but it's really hard when you move around every one to three years. Uh, so anyway, in 2013, I ended up in Montgomery, Alabama, very upset because I figured that's not a great place to live and I'm not going to be able to do anything there. What ended up being surprising was that's where I ended up buying all my houses, all 30 properties that I have today started when I landed there in Montgomery, Alabama. I ran into uh, another military student. We were going to uh, Air War College and I ran into him on the first day of class. He was introducing himself to everybody and he said something about, you know, I've been here a couple of years and I've you know, bought like four properties and at this rate, you know, I'm gonna retire rich in a few years. And I was like, wait a second, what did that guy just say? So long story short, I ran up to him after class and I said, what are you talking about? Like, how are you investing here? How much does it cost? Who's your manager company? I, I, I peppered him with questions. He answered all of them, pretty much became my mentor, showed me what he was doing. I bought six houses in the next 10 months. Well, what I didn't really realize is this other person who, who wants to buy from me right now, he was also a student at the same time. And mm. he also was using the same method I was. So he was also buying houses in the same neighborhood and kind of had the same mentor I did, but we didn't really meet each other. We didn't really know each other that well. So that's how we met. We, we both started buying at the exact same time when we were both attending the same military school. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> how, how long did it take before you, you like crossed paths and figured out that you both had the same strategy, same strategy in the same location? It's kind of, it's been weird because we really, we've, I've never talked to him until just a couple days ago. I've never talked to him on the phone. I friended him on Facebook. I think maybe we said something to each other like, man, we have a lot in common. We should probably talk. We have never really, I'm pretty sure that, you know, the mentor, uh, he, he um, talked to me, you know, talked to me about, about this guy and, and, and vice versa. Like he was, I heard a lot about him. I just never had contact with him. But um, I think he was aware that I had a blog, you know, and I had like a YouTube channel and he was doing some of his own stuff. I think at some point he had a podcast and we were just kind of aware of each other. But he knew what I had in my portfolio and um, he wants back into the mar market. He, he needs to park a lot of money. And by the way, it's, it's, it's going to be a cash offer. He's still, uh, he's still formulating. He's a few days away from giving me a price. I, we've already started talking price, but I was the one that went first. And, uh, you know, he balked a little bit and he complained and he tried to tell me I was wrong. And I told him <laughs> I was, I can get more into this if you want, but I, pretty yeah, much told him, like, yeah. I, you know, pretty much told him like, no, you're wrong. And then, and then, and then basically it's, it's his turn. That's like a very long story short. It's in his ballpark and it's in sort of his court now. And he, I said, Hey, look, I gave you a number. Now it's your turn to give me an offer. And, and he basically said, okay, give me a few days. So would you want me to like, I mean, I could talk a little bit more about how we started negotiating or I don't know what you might be interested yeah. in. Yeah, juicy G, I, to the oh, extent man, I hope he's still in it. Man, I hope he's not listening. Uh, you know, ho hopefully everything's <laughs> okay. <here. laughs> We'll, we'll check later and see if he's one of your students, okay? <laughs> that would that would be so clever if he was. I would. <laughs> so, so basically, um, you know, I tried to come up with a number to give him for my thirty properties, and the way that I did that, and this is kind of crude and basic, uh, but I just wanted to get a number. Basically, I took, and, and here's the interesting thing about our properties: like he knows. The market he knows everything he knows the rents he knows like you know turnover rates he knows what repairs cost like there's no we both know what's going on in this so there's, it's not like we're going to be uh, pulling each other's leg or something so i i know that my expenses run probably about 40 percent and they're pro it's probably less uh but i decided that i was going to calculate my properties at a cap rate of six mm -hmm. and uh take out 40% expenses to come up with a net operating income. And I know I'm throwing a lot out here right now. 
Mm. And like that, that is how I calculated what uh, I wanted him to pay for the properties. And I got this from talking to a bunch of different people. Interesting, interestingly enough, one of the people I talked to about evaluating these properties is, uh, was here at the beach. He happened to be like a, you know, like a, somebody who had done multifamily real estate, you know, and he was in the banking sector. He retired and he's basically been doing like two months in Hawaii. But we sat here on the beach, like this beach that I'm at right now. And, and he gave me a bunch of advice on uh, how to, you know, how to buy this property. And I've talked to a couple of other people about it. But that's where I got my number from. And, that, and that's what I approached him with. And of course, he felt like it was high. Wow. That, that sounds very fair to me. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, that, that just sounds extremely fair. So, you know, like figure out the net operating income and then yep. and then some multiple of that is I mean, that's how you that's how you value a business. Like you value a business based on a, a multiple of uh, revenue or a multiple of profits. Yeah, and this is interesting. And of course, students can try this. Anybody can try this. But like you go on the Internet, you can Google like there'll be a lot of uh, websites that will tell you like this is the standard, um, you know, this is like the standard cap rate in this city. So you can get that. And I ended up finding that 6.2, 6.3. And a lot of times it's broken down by like quality of property and type of property and all this stuff. But really, I was finding numbers around six, and originally I was going to go seven cap, which means I was going to ask for less money. And I was advised by more than a few people that that was uh, not correct and that I should be closer to six. So that's where I started off. Of course, he balked at it. So, so I'll, I'll give some more information about this. He used an example. I guess it's a street that I own on and that he owns on. And he's like, hey, on this particular street, um, I can buy a property for like 80000 and and for $80,000, it's going to be fully renovated. You know, it's going to be like, um, you're, I'm going to have a new roof, I'm going to have a new AC, and it's like all fully remodeled inside. And he's like, well, you're trying to sell me properties for, you know, almost 100000 each. Um, so you're way off. And then I just did like a quick, like, honestly, I haven't even considered, like, I haven't looked at my market carefully as far as like what's for sale recently. Um, mm -hmm. So I just like went on Zillow and you know, typed in my zip code and I actually found a house on that street. I found a house on that street that was for sale and it was, it was going for $130,000. Right. Mm. So I'm just like, well, here's an example. How about looking at this one? It's 130,000. And then I, I used an example of two more streets that I own on, uh, that I have pro you know, multiple properties on. And I said, I'm seeing, you know, 120, I'm seeing 130 and, 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 you know, basically, what you're telling me about 80,000, that's just not jiving with what I'm seeing in the real world. Um, maybe these prices are high. M maybe they're overvalued. But certainly what you're saying about 80,000 is not close. And then that's kind of when I basically said, okay. But anyway, whatever. I've given you my number. Now it's your turn to make me an offer. So that's kind of where I left it. Ooh. Yeah. And I mean, it's oh. been all, you know, it's been all friendly. It's all friendly so far. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, we're, uh, we're going to have to see where this all lands. Uh, I'm nervous about it. When I, when I texted him the number, I mean, like, you know, we're just like texting each other, right? We text people every day. But like the number that I texted him, it's like a life-changing sum of money. And mm. it freaked me out. Like, I, I was thinking to myself, I can't believe I'm texting somebody a number this big. <laughs> You know, it's like, like, it's no big deal. You're like, oh, you know, because like, you text every day, you text like hundreds of times. And I'm like, I think I, wa I think I want this much money for my property. But it, honestly, it was really bizarre. Uh, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe when you get into buying and selling stuff for a while, it's no big deal. But it certainly uh, shocked me that I was even, you know, asking for one big round number for all my properties. Uh, now, granted, I do have to pay off a few loans, uh, but still, uh, a decent part of that would, you know, would, would become part of what would be in the bank. So, yeah, it, it's, it's been a, a whirlwind of emotions, uh, a little stressful, uh, but hanging out at the beach and, and hanging out with friends sure helps a lot. Hmm. Well, one of, to what you said about uh, texting, one of the weirdest things about adulthood I found is mm -hmm. how much like important stuff happens in r really casual ways. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, 
just a text or just a you know a whatever like you know you you and I both have the same uh real you know we both work with the same real estate agent in Indianapolis and yeah. he texts us all the time to be like what do you it think does. of this yeah and I'm like cool maybe we should make an offer <laughs> like you know and it's, it's just pretty like, casual right it's pretty casual <laughs> exactly exactly yeah well the other thing that's scary to me how casual it is right but also I mean, I'm just watching this everywhere. I mean, you know, I, again, I came out of the military, so a lot of people in the military have, have access to VA loans, right? Mm -hmm. VA loans mean, mean no money down, right? But in this market, with everybody like multiple offers, offering cash, waiving their, waiving their contingency for being able to do an inspection, like it's so hard to buy a property right now. Mm -hmm. And that's why, I mean, so people are by text just saying, make an offer on this property and like add 20,000 and waive my contingency for inspection. And this is all happening by text. And I think it's insanity, you know? Right. Right. Well, certainly like inexperienced home buyers or retail home buyers. Um, it's like, it's such a different game. You know, if you're buying yeah. 30 properties, if you're buying 30 properties and you screw up on one of them, like <laughs> you've got the rest to kind of balance it out. Yeah, you're right. But, Retail home buyers have so much more on the line. If, if if they're buying one property every ten years for themselves, like they they better get that one right. Hey, I have to assume if I'm just just changing the subject, I have to assume that since I'm looking at you and your avatar, you're looking at me and my avatar. Is that right? Yeah, totally. And then everybody else is looking at both avatars. Is that correct? Exactly. Exactly. Okay, just making sure I understand. It's a pretty it's pretty it's a pretty cool app. I like it. <laughs> yeah, I do too. I do it took me a while. I was like, what is this? There's so many new apps happening right now. What's going on here? Yeah. But yeah. uh but yeah, I like the I like that like the avatar makes it just personal enough, but I still don't have to actually like do my hair or put on any makeup. So that makes it easier. What, what do you, well, I see your hair. It looks it looks pretty good actually, and I like I oh. like the bow. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. Yes, my yep. cartoon hair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so, how are you faring in the world of um, like right now? Well, of course, GameStop and and Reddit and AMC and there's mm. all of that mm. right? yes. happening. And then and now, crypto is like the next hot thing. And basically, like oh. once. Once every 10 days, there's a new, like, next hot thing in the world of investing. Um, yeah. What are, how are, are you, are you involved in any of that? So, yes and no, right? Yes and no, I'm involved in it. <laughs> yeah, let, let me know, what, I'll let you know what I mean by that. Well, I think, you know, I mean, I have like a, I have like, a, you know, people in the military, right? I kind of do have like a, a website where I talk about military finance. And so we have our own version of, of a 401k. It's called a TSP. And a lot of times I talk about, you know, maybe different ways to invest in that. And so, and so like, you know, whatever on social media or, or a, a podcast or a, a blog or whatever blog post or just people emailing, it's always questions about, well, should I do this or should I do that? Which I think obviously Paul is something you get a lot as well, right? Questions mm -hmm. about stuff like that. Um, I feel like my life is pretty easy. Although I, I don't know if, you know, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to call me uh, I don't know if the right word is ignorant, but my life is easy because I just dismiss a lot of that stuff. Like I really, I just dismiss it. I dismiss mm. crypto. Now, and, and mm. I and I know I know what's going on with Elon Musk and you know the S and P five hundred, and I've heard all kinds of stuff about how I'm missing out. But I I got to be honest, I pretty much dismiss it. Uh, I dismiss uh, GameStop, you know, and like you know that that whole thing about whatever a pump and dump, or you know everybody's jumping in trying to make money on the wild craze, and then everybody's mad because they can't invest. Mm. I know Paula, you came in and said like you know we all have the right. Was it something like we we should all have the right to do something stupid with our money or something to that effect? Exactly. I yeah. Know, I don't know if I'm quoting you quite right, but uh, but I agree with that sentiment. Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I. You know, I mean, I, I'm a I'm an index fund guy. I'm a S and P 500 index. I'm a set it and forget it. You know, kind of. I heard this advice from Warren Buffett when I was probably 18 years old. You know that if you really don't want to follow the markets closely every day, you're better off putting your money in an index fund and then not doing anything else. And 
I've, I did that. I did that my entire time in the military. So I've done that for more than 20 years. It's really made my life simple. Uh, I've done well in, with my investments, which are, you know, unusually simple to the point where it's not very exciting. Like, you know, like the stuff that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. But uh, and I have a, a lot of confidence I'm not going to lose money, you know, in some sort of, you know, when some sort of bubble bursts for, you know, an overvalued uh, fad. So I don't know if that's too simplistic of an answer for you, but that's just kind of how I feel. Mm. So he, so big picture, zooming out, yeah. do you think that part of the reason um, that you keep your – that you keep your market investments so simple is because you pay attention to the real estate side. In other words, if Mm -hmm. you were not a real estate investor, do you think that you would take that, that energy and that time and that attention and direct it to more complex equity investing? And I love this question. I love it. No, I would say absolutely not. No, that's not why. And, 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 um, I, I honestly believe that it's the smartest way. I mean, I believe that investing in the S&P 500 index, uh, I'm going to beat 95, 98% of people mm-hmm. that are trying to, um, you know, figure out what's hot right now and figure out what's low and figure out what's high and, you know, put a little money in this or put a little money in that and sign up for the Motley Fool I hope Motley Fool is not a sponsor. Um, They're not. You know, They're I, not. Okay, good. Um, you know, si- sign up for newsletters. Uh, read the Wall Street Journal, Money Magazine. Like, I just don't believe in any of that. I'm going to do better than all of them. Uh, and I'm going to save so much time and so much hassle. I don't have to read the news every day. I don't have to, to watch cable news or, what. you know, I don't have to follow everything closely. Because I just believe that all that short-term hype really isn't that useful. And I, I kind of just like to... I just believe in the simplicity of index fund investing as unsophisticated as it sounds. That's honestly what I believe. Mm. Mm. Nice. What, um, what drew you to rental properties? Mm -hmm. uh, Particularly like given, so somebody asked me this the other day, you know, they were like, what do you do if you want to invest in rentals, but you just, uh, you don't have any time and you're, um, you know, you, yeah, you, you, you basically like, what do you do if you want to invest in rentals, but you're time crunched? Um, and that's, that's easy. A yeah. Question that I, yeah, that yeah. I always get, but mm-hmm. you know, you started, you were overseas when you started. Um, yeah. So yeah. Tell me about, tell me about that. So I think generally how I would answer that question is I don't think you should invest in real estate unless you seem drawn to it somehow, unless you think you're going to enjoy it or will enjoy it. Uh, And then, you know, Mm. of course, like how can I invest in real estate if I don't have any time? That's like a, some kind of a passive investment in real estate, which kind of really isn't investing in real estate. In my opinion, you're, you're investing in somebody else investing in real estate and hoping that that person does well. And uh, to me, those two things are, are very, very different. Now, mm, I guess so my point is... You're saying like syndication or crowdsourcing. Oh, so you, I guess, to, yeah. To yeah. Clar- exactly. So that, yes, I agree. That is not real estate investing. That is right. picking, a, p- that's picking a horse yep, in the horse exactly. race. Yeah. So, you know, I don't think I'd bother with real estate investing unless somehow I'm, you know, somehow you're drawn to it. Somehow you think you'll enjoy it. Somehow something about it seems interesting to you. And I will tell you my story quickly, if you don't mind, I hope I don't bore you guys with this. Why I'm interested in real estate. It took me a long time to figure this out. I probably was on several podcasts, including yours, Paula. And I think after Mm -hmm. I soul searched a lot, I, I think I figured out what the trigger was for me, what it was in my life that made me want to invest in real estate. And it was my grandmother, right? It was my grandmother. Mm. So she, um, she grew up in a very rough part of Los Angeles called Watts. I don't know if you've heard of this, but it's a really rough area. And anyway, she got married. She had kids. She moved to a better part of LA, but she ended up a single mom, you know, uh, uh, husband left, which is my grandpa who I've never met. He left and she's raising four kids on her own. Well, somebody told her, I think it might have been a family member or something, you know, you should buy 
you should buy a property. Buy something that has like more than one unit and you could live in one and you could rent out the rest. Now, this is a long time ago. This isn't like recent stuff. This is, you know, I don't know how long ago this was, 40, you know, 50, 60 years ago. And so, she, I mean, basically what she did is she house hacked, right? But she house hacked like way back when. Now, the funny thing was her dad told her, you have no business buying a house. You know, you're a woman. You know, that, that's stupid. You're crazy. You're going to fail. Her friends all told her she was going to fail. Everybody told her, like, you, you can't do this. You can't buy a, a fourplex like this. It's never going to work. Well, she bought that fourplex. And it has been, I mean, it has been her financial salvation for her whole life. It is worth a ton of money now. It brought her cash flow throughout her life. It allowed her to provide for her family. She has, you know, a sizable amount of money to leave to all her kids when she passes away. And I think I was just always um, admired her for that. And it also uh, piqued, I guess it piqued my interest in, in real estate. Hmm. Hmm. So, yeah, so you saw what it can do and you saw its power and you saw yeah. that, that the people, you know, that that a, a single mom 60 years ago, a single mom of four kids could do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and then I guess on so the other was, side, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. So on the other side of my family and, and my grandfather, um, when I was probably four or five years old, he was always bringing me to construction sites, right? He was a superintendent. So he was in charge of building new construction. And he would usually build a whole neighborhood all at once. He was kind of like the guy in charge, right? Like he didn't own the company, but he was just the guy that was sort of running all the workers. And I was just fascinated by watching him at work and watching him build these houses and having him go around and talk to everybody and, you know, chew people out and give people encouragement. And I also remember like that these, these like um, these food trucks would come and like, since he was a superintendent, they'd let him have food for free and they'd let me have food. And like, I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Uh, but, but anyway, I was just intrigued by real estate and this was in Southern California. I remember, I remember being 12 years old and thinking to myself, God, I wish I could buy a house right now, because if I could buy one right now, imagine what it would be worth by the time I was 18 years old. Like I was thinking like this as a 12 year old. <laughs> so I guess my so I guess my point is I've always had an interest in real estate. And that is why I'm investing in real estate. I, I'm not investing in real estate because I want to make money because I want to get rich. I think there's a lot of different ways to to make money. Real estate is one of them. I think it's hard to do if you kind of find that you don't really have an interest for it so that's kind of my uh approach to that mm. and you know and in in many ways that does answer like if the original question is gee what if i want to invest in real estate but i don't have the time i mean the <laughs> the reality is if you are interested in something you do make the time for it you yeah know, like nobody has time we all but we make time for things that that really appeal to us we make time for things yeah. that we we really want well yeah. i mean it's kind of like saying i want to get good at this but i don't want to spend any time on it so like what should i do like that's kind of how the question sounds to me you know and right obviously that you can't answer that question or the answer is sort of obvious like this right. is complicated and it's difficult and i don't want to deal with it so how should i do it yeah. In the answer, in yeah, the answer like, is, I'd like to can... learn how to play yeah. tennis, but I don't actually right. want to pick up a racket. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, again, the, the answer is then you're going to let somebody else do it. And I hope they do a good job, you know, investing with your money. Uh, but if you're going to do it, then um, you're going to have to uh, you know, take a course. You're going to have to read some books. You're going to have to get out there and try. You're going to get beat up a little bit. You know, the first property, the second property might not be that smooth and you're going to figure it out. And I say all that because that's exactly what happened to me. Mm, right. Right. On, on the topic of letting other people do it. So you and I have, I don't think we've ever actually talked about our, our philosophies around like crowdfunding or real estate syndication or even turnkey yeah. deals. But I, sus I suspect yeah. that you and I, even though we haven't discussed it, I, I suspect you and I probably have the same attitude towards it which mm. is like, 
Vo can I put the vomit <laughs> emoji right here? <laughs> hey, do I get to do anything with emojis here? I don't know. I think other people are doing things with emojis here. Yeah, yeah. I think as speakers, I don't think we can emoji our own okay. conversation. Well, then next time, next time I'll listen in. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know, Paula. Do you want to? I mean, can I ask you? I mean, tell me, tell me how you feel about Turnkey. I have certainly Ugh. strong feelings about turnkey. it. I've certainly writ written about it. Yeah, Turnkey. I mean, isn't that the easiest turnkey way to the... to invest? Ugh. it's the worst option of them all. Like even like even amongst syndication and crowdsourcing and all of that, I think Turnkey is the absolute worst because you are literally getting nothing. Like, okay, first of all. The, their claim is that they will renovate this home for you. Um, you know that they'll mm -hmm. that they'll shop for a home, they'll buy it, they'll renovate it, they'll rent it out. You know they they claim that they'll handle all of that. The thing yeah. that they don't tell you is the following: number one, like your job is not to quote unquote like your job is not to do these tasks. Your job is to exercise judgment. You know yeah. your job is to exercise judgment around what neighborhood will be good and will have a good cap rate relative to, um, you know, a good cap rate relative to the neighborhood profile. Uh, yeah. Your job is to understand the neighborhoods well enough to know which neighborhood uh, is a good fit for you in terms of the risk reward that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, your job is to decide to what degree do you want your home renovated? Do you want it to be like, just merely habitable do you want it to, to do you want to renovate it to the point where it's feasible but that's it do you want yeah. to renovate it to like the top of the range in that neighborhood so you've got um a b plus property in a b minus neighborhood you know mm -hmm. like your and what's what materials are you going to choose are you going to select materials for durability for long-term durability like those decisions are your job your job is not to actually um you know, write up the purchase and sale agreement. That's what your agent does. Your job is not to yeah. actually crawl around on your hands and knees, uh, like, you know, looking at the, the crawl space. Like, that's what your inspector does. Your job yeah. is not to, you know, um, install baseboards. Like, that's what your contractors do. Like, your job mm -hmm. is to make decisions. Yeah. And, and decision making can never be outsourced to somebody else. And a, the claim that a turnkey company has is that we will handle the decision making for you. But that's not <laughs> actually a thing that anyone can reasonably do. And if mm -hmm. you're doing it right, like if you're actually properly doing your own due diligence, then you still have to do all that work because you have to decide whether or not you agree with the judgment that the turnkey company made. So yes. if your use of a turnkey company makes it so that it's quote unquote less work, what that tells me is that you have not done proper due diligence. And if you have <laughs> done proper due diligence, then it is not less work. So you're paying for literally nothing because if you're doing it right, it's not less work. It's exactly yeah. the same amount of work just with a premium. Ooh, ooh, yep, no, I, I yeah. are you ready? Do I, I'll come in and give my angle on it. It's like the same, yeah, I yeah, think yeah. I have the same exact philosophy but I'm going to mm -hmm. approach it from a little bit different perspective. Uh, Ooh, yeah. I, I, I hope I have, I wish I could do it with as much passion as you did though. Uh, <laughs> but I, I feel, I feel as sick, right? I feel sick when I hear about turnkey property companies and mm -hmm. I get scared when I'm in investing groups like Facebook groups and they're like, Hey, what should I do? And it's the question that, that you brought up. Like, I, you know, I want to invest, but like, I don't know where or how, and you know, I'm too busy to learn. How about I just do a turnkey company? And then like five or six people jump in and they're like, yeah, I did it. And I'm making good money. And they're probably mm -hmm. wrong, but, but so I, I hear that <laughs> yeah. a lot. Right. And first of all, these, they probably don't understand how, how real estate and how expenses work, but here's the problem with everything you said, and then I'll, I'll add to it, or at least look at it from a different perspective. Here's the problem with turnkey real estate. In real estate, you make all your money at the beginning. That's, I believe you make your money when you buy. You make mm -hmm. your money by buying at a good price and by getting a good deal and by maybe setting up an opportunity for value add. That is where all the profit happens. It happens at the beginning. If you buy at the wrong price, if you buy too expensive, 
and you never get a good ROI. And when you sell, like you don't, you don't get any capital gains. You don't get to keep any money. So mm. it all happens at the beginning. Now, here's the problem with a turnkey company. When you go to a turnkey company, they do all of the things at the beginning that you're supposed to do if you want to make money. That's what a turnkey mm. property does. They're the ones that go out and buy it from a wholesaler or go, or go find it themselves, right? And it needs a lot of work. They do that. They get it renovated, right? And they get it like rent ready. Not you're supposed to do that, but they're doing it for you, okay? You uh, or they, uh, they're going to find a property management company or maybe they are the property management company or they find one for you. They're going to put a renter in there. Then they're going to sell it to you. And all they ask in return is that they take all the profit that you should have gotten, okay? Mm. All they want in return is they're going to sell to you for a large premium. So you're not really making, you're not going to make any money when you sell it and you're not making a very good ROI. So basically mm. you've lost your chance to make money on this house. There's no meat left on the bone because they've taken it all because they've done all the important work because you didn't want to, or you didn't want to learn how. So that is my, that is my feelings about turnkey properties. Mm. Ooh, I have one more thing to add also. I, I agree with yeah. all of that. So the other thing is when they do renovate it, okay, so you and I, as owners of a property who plan on holding the mm -hmm. property for 15, 20, 25, 30 years, like when we make decisions related to the renovation of a property, we are making those decisions with the eye of somebody who's going to hold on to this thing for 20 years. Yeah. So when we're choosing materials, we're choosing, we're choosing with durability in mind. Um, <laughs> yeah. you know, when we're, you know, when we're like, when we're picking a water heater, when we're picking out, um, the flooring, right. Yeah. We're, we're like, we're going to pick, um, flooring that's durable. They're going to pick flooring that e even if that durable flooring costs a little bit more in the short term, but it's going to last five years, 10 years longer. Right. Yeah. They're picking mm -hmm. whatever materials are cheapest immediately because they don't care about durability because they're just going to flip this to an investor. And so yeah, not only right. are you paying a premium for renovations, you're not even getting highly durable renovations. So you're going to have to redo a bunch of that work soon. Mm -hmm. No, you're right. Uh, that, and, and the other thing, too, and it goes along the same line, it's very common when you get sold a property like this, you know, and like you're in California and this company is like in Kansas or something, they do a bad job doing the renovations. I mean, they might need, not even really be supervising it very well. It is going to the mm -hmm. cheapest bidder and it's shoddy work. And then the price is flipped to you and you've got a house yeah. that maybe still needs work or things start breaking. Also, you might inherit a tenant that's kind of crappy and you might realize you have a property manager company. That's so these, these kind of things happen. There's a lot of scams or a lot of uh, bad situations that have come out of turnkey properties. I can think a few that I don't know if I should name by name, but like there's been some very well-known famous people who got involved in turnkey properties and uh, ended up being sued for millions of dollars because they ripped off everybody that invested with them. So it really leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Now, is there a turnkey property out there in the world that is worth their money? Um, probably, but still, you have to give them most of the profit if you don't want to do the work. Mm. Well, and if to have enough knowledge to know if something is good, then you have to do enough due diligence to find that out. And by the time yeah. you've done that due diligence, you've already done the work. That's right. That's right. Yes, it's true. Yeah. And I mean, I think what happens to turnkey property companies is that they don't, you end up buying in a bad neighborhood because you didn't do the homework, right? You didn't, you didn't do your due diligence and you didn't realize that this is a horrible neighborhood. No wonder, no wonder the house was so cheap. It's not because you got a good deal. It's because it's, it's a horrible neighborhood with high crime and your tenants are never going to stay longer than six months. So, I mean, that also happens. So I guess me and you might see eye to eye on turnkey properties. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it. All right, but what's your, other, yeah, what's your take that, then on like, 
crowdsourced uh, real estate, you know, where yeah. you get on a website and there's a bunch of people who are buying, who are all going in on buying like uh, so like is fundrise? Unit. Is fundrise what you're talking about? Fundrise is that an example? I mean, I'm not. I won't name names, but there's a handful of them. But okay, uh, yeah, you know the ones where you I, go I bring, online. I bring that up. To, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, you you know what I mean. The ones see. the ones where you go online and they're saying, hey, you can you can go in on this like 200 unit place in Texas. Oh, okay. Well, then we're talking more syndication. And yes, all right. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, those. Well, first of all, I've never done it. I haven't gotten involved in it yet. Um, I would consider that an advanced investing strategy. And what I mean by that is, uh, I think that if you're going to do something like that, you're diversifying your investments. You already have money in the stock market. You already have your own single family portfolio. You have experience. Mm -hmm. You have some money in the bank. And it's like, you know what? I'm interested in multifamily. Uh, I've learned a lot about it. I know some people that are doing it. Uh, and, and you do due diligence. You do due diligence and you have to look at these presentations where they explain all the numbers and how they're going to manage it and how they're going to make money and what their contingency plans are. And then you decide to invest. So, the other thing is, um, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of, I mean, it's complicated. Uh, you have to, you end up kind of, you're passively investing. So you have to trust that the one or two or three or four people that are doing all the work are, uh, are good people and hopefully have a good track record. The other important thing is that even though these uh, large, you know, let's say a, a 200 unit property, even though they have a management fee every month, the people that are selling you the deal, they charge you another management fee. And it can be like one or 2%, but they're taking like a separate management fee for managing the deal. They're also charging you when they purchase the property. They're, they're charging extra money at the purchase. They charge extra money at the sale. So like there's all these extra fees built in and they have to do like an amazing job for you to make money in the long run. So that's, again, that's just my, my two cents on it. Yeah. Yeah. So my thinking is it's like, okay, the reason that I'm not a fan of it is twofold. One is as, as you sort of alluded to, you need to do a ton of due diligence on the deal itself. Like yeah. why do they want that particular apartment building in that particular section of Brooklyn? You know, mm -hmm. um, how much do you know about apartment buildings in Brooklyn or, you know, uh, shopping malls in Atlanta or like, how, you know, how much do you know about the area? How much do you know about those types of deals? Like you need to do a ton of due diligence in order to evaluate the deal itself, like why yeah. you would, you know, yeah. And then on top of that, you need to also, because you've got specific people managing it, like picking a manager is itself a skill. So I kind of think of it as like the actively managed mutual fund um, mm -hmm. analog to real estate investing. Like with an actively managed mutual fund, uh, the reason so many, I mean, one of the many reasons that people do poorly with actively managed mutual funds is that like the justification for, for that those funds is like, oh, well, there's going to be a fund manager who is in charge of picking the underlying stocks, right? Yeah, yeah. That's what's happening with uh, with syndication is like you've got managers who are in charge of picking the real estate deal. And so now your job is to know enough to pick a good managers. And if yeah. especially if you're a beginner or if you've never met these people or, you know, like if you don't know, you know, you don't know what you know, like you don't know what you don't know, like you're not going to be good at, picking a good manager like in in the yeah. world of stock investing the, in the world of stock investing there are there's an in, there are entire professions dedicated to m the selection of fund managers like not yeah. being a fund manager but selecting fund managers that's a profession mm -hmm. in and of itself because it's a skill set in and of itself so it you know when you have all like newbies who think that they're qualified to evaluate 
uh, fund man, essentially a fund manager. Uh-huh. Um, you know, it's just you, you you end up in a situation where you have a lot of people who don't really know what they're getting into, and they're just throwing their money and like kind of almost essentially eeny meeny miny mowing where their money is going, and so yeah, they're right. giving up uh, their judgment. They're giving up their ability, you know, their their ability to make decisions and to guide their own money. Um, and they're, you know, trusting all of that to someone who they don't really know anything about. Yeah. Like, and, so, and I'm not, yeah, I'm not suggesting sense, that the yeah. manager will necessarily be like shady, but just how mm-hmm. do you know if that manager is a good manager? Exactly. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll add something else about syndication real quick. And that is, it's amazing. It's amazingly popular and it's huge and it's so, and, and people love it, but which people love it. It's the people that are doing it. And what I mean by that is the syndicators, they love it because it is Mm. a way, it is a way to invest in real estate without using any of your own money. You're, you're Mm. finding all these people, all these people to passively invest with you. You're the active manager. You're the general partner on the deal. And you've got all these limited partners, all, all, you know, just people like, you know, like me and you that are just investing in a deal, but not going to participate in the everyday decisions. Right. But what's interesting Mm -hmm. about it is these people putting the deal together often, often they don't put any of their own money into the deal. Right. They don't put any of their own money in and they get an ownership percentage. That ownership percentage comes out of everybody else's. So if partners, if limited partners raise whatever, 10 million, you know, they might end up giving 10 or 15% to the general partners to own just as sort of a fee for them managing it. So they get ownership. I talked about it before. They, they get a management fee. They get an acquisition fee for purchasing. There's another fee when they sell. It's very lucrative for the general partners. It is not necessarily lucrative for the passive investors, unless the deal just makes tons of money. Right, right. Which is, yeah, which is, re- which you don't, as a, as a new real estate investor, uh, a, like, would a person like that would not have the skill to be able to separate the wheat from the chaff. Yeah. 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 So I don't. I, yeah, it, you're right. It is very, but I think part of the reason, part of the reason we hear so much about it is because these syndication deals are so heavily advertised. And the reason that they're yeah. so heavily advertised is because they're very lucrative for the people on the other side of the deal. That's right. That's right. Paula, you brought up, I guess, was it crowdsourcing, right? Which I think is a little bit different, right? I, when I think of crowdsourcing, correct me if I'm wrong, it's kind of like you talked about earlier. I want to invest in real estate, but like I don't have the time. I would also argue that if somebody didn't have a lot of money, but they wanted to invest in real estate, my understanding of crowdsourcing is you can go in and spend like $5,000, right? And then buy some like partial ownership through some crowdsourcing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, that thing. Yeah. That thing, right? You can invest five or $10,000 and collectively invest in this company's portfolio of real estate. You don't have to fix toilets, right? You don't have to manage. You don't have to do anything. It's almost like putting your money in the stock market. You know, you're just Mm -hmm. buying shares of properties. Um, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan because you're not really investing for the reasons that we already talked about. You're not really Mm -hmm. investing in real estate. You're not. It's like you said, Paul, it's the decisions. You're not participating in the important decisions that make you money. Uh, You're just giving someone your money and say, see if you can get any extra money for it. See if you can make me some more money. Like here's $5,000. I hope I get some more. And like beyond that, like you don't really know or care what's going on. And that's not really investing in real estate, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. That's like basically speculation at that point. Yeah. Yeah. You're you're basically just a a glorified uh, Reddit game stopper at that point. Oh boy. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Hey, Paula, I don't know. You, you change, you know, I gave you my kind of my whole spiel on uh, the cryptocurrency. Right. And, but I mean, I was very obviously dismissive because I used the word dismissive. Uh, I don't Mm -hmm. know if we have any time left, but uh, I kind of want to hear where you fall. If you don't mind me changing the subject that much. 
where you fall on the craze mm. or, or where you fall on. I mean, it seems like you have a, a middle ground and where you're not mm. like totally. OK, I'm ready to hear it. Ooh, so, yeah, I've been thinking about cryptocurrencies a lot uh, lately. So yeah. um, I, my ideas have not fully gelled um, mm. uh, in this area yet. Mm, but yep. early early impressions include the following. Number one, um, it is it is it is certainly true that the uh, if you think about the valuation of any asset, right? Yeah. Um, assets are valued for number one for like the income that they produce. So rental properties or businesses uh, are valued yeah. based on the income that they produce. And then assets are also valued based on what other people believe that they're worth. So mm -hmm. essentially, you've got that dividend or that income stream. Um, and, and you've got valuations based on that. And that's a more intrinsic form of value. Mm -hmm. And then you also have um, just the crowd collectively deciding that something is worth something. You know, yeah. and that's that more speculative form of value. So on one hand, it is certainly the case that, you know, cryptocurrencies don't inherently produce income. Like they don't inherently have value in the way that a business or a piece of real estate would. And so any investment in, uh, in the cryptocurrency market is purely an appreciation play and therefore purely speculative. Right. Um, you know, that is, I think that, that part is, I think, unarguably true. Um, that said, like there is a limited amount of, um, of a given cryptocurrency. Right. A and, and so anytime that there is, that something is in limited supply, and the demand exceeds that supply, then the price of it can go up. You know, like an example would be um, the taxi medallions in New York City prior to when Uber and Lyft came and disrupted the market. Like yes. those medallions were um, oftentimes traded among cab drivers and, and grew in value because of the fact that they were limited. Um, another example yeah. would be like um, uh, Burning Man tickets. You know, which are limited, and then, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then uh, people who sell them, like they, they often can go up in price. Um, they're not supposed to, you know, the, but they do. You know that that does happen. Uh, yeah. Mm. And and so, uh, so, okay, similar to a fiat currency. Um, you know, the, the U.S. dollar used to be pegged to the gold standard. And when it was unpegged from gold and became a fiat currency, a lot of people said, like, well, you know, how what is the value of a dollar? It, the value is only what people collectively decide it is. Yeah. Um, and so there was a lot of concern about that at the time that the that the U.S. dollar became unpegged from the gold standard. Yeah. Um, and that is the same concern about cryptocurrencies. But the difference is with the U.S. dollar or with any like government-sponsored fiat currency, the, the government can print more of it. And, and we're seeing that happen right now. And I think that the fact that there is so much uh, interest in the cryptocurrency market right now, um, I mean, it stems from a few different uh, sources. You know, there, there are multiple factors that contribute to the current rise in cryptos, but I think concern about inflation and concern about um, the printing of money is one of the drivers that is that is causing um, the current surge of one of many drivers that's causing the current surge yeah. of interest in the crypto mm -hmm. market. Um, now, I lay all of that out to kind of analyze like what what is happening, like all right, what yeah. fundamentally what is crypto? And why are people interested in it right now? Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, it's, I'm still, it's too early for me to have an opinion on it yet. 
Um, hmm. Okay. Yeah. Paula, will you come get me if I need to start paying attention? <laughs> to cryptos? Just, just come get me. Just be like, hey, Rich, you might want to start paying attention. I think this is becoming so, a thing. I I have a friend who... um who ran oh he he ran this incredible like he he basically did a lot of statistical analysis on like mm -hmm. the, you know the price of bitcoin and um the rate at which it's appreciating and the standard deviation around yeah um, I, it, it was very complicated he explained it to me and i i he explained it to me like multiple times and i was able to keep up with probably a fourth of what he said yeah. Um, but he he and people like him have basically looked at past past behavior as a predictor of, of future values mm -hmm. and have essentially run statistical models that say if the price continues to rise in the way that it historically has here are the price targets that we set for, you know, one year, two years, three years out um, with the caveat that, you know, within one standard deviation, this is the range within two standard deviations. This is the range. Um, so yeah. you know, with the caveat that there could be a significant amount of standard deviation around these predicted values. Huh. Um, and if that that data is to be believed, uh, then, then it would keep rising in price with with large volatile swings along the way, yeah. or the potential for large volatile swings along the way. But yeah. it would uh, keep rising in price again if that data is to be believed. The issue, however, like with the underlying premise, is that they're looking at data from they're looking at less than ten years of data, mm -hmm. and. Um, that is inherently different from looking at data from the S&P 500 over the last 100 years for two reasons. Yeah. Number one, the longer duration. But number two, the S&P 500 is anchored um, and comprised of companies that do have intrinsic value. And so, you know, to the extent that we can look at the last decade of data of cryptos and try to extrapolate that it, to make predictions about the next 10 years or even the next three years um sure if the next three years continues the way that the past 10 years have then then in all based on based on that assessment the price would continue to rise with massive with the potential for massive swings along the way but oh. the un you know whether or not we can use that underlying premise um like whether or not we can look at the last 10 years as a predictor of the next three to five, that part I think can still be called into question. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, that's a complicated answer, but uh, <laughs> yeah. you're still formulating. You're still formulating. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Exactly. I, I think, I think there's a lot of power in not rushing to an opinion. And I think there's a lot of power yeah. in uh, sometimes taking months or years before before a viewpoint is fully fleshed out. Right, but uh, but I guess what about the idea of yeah, but you've lost out on a hundred thousand in a hundred thousand percent of gain. And maybe that's not an exaggeration, you know, or ten thousand <laughs> percent of gain. I mean, there are. There's opportunity cost everywhere, yeah. you know. Um, there's there's opportunity cost not just in the world of cryptocurrencies, but in many many different types of assets that I'm not pursuing right now. Um, of course, I'm not pursuing yeah. tax mm -hmm. liens. I'm not pursuing, mm -hmm. um, you know, mobile home parks at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not. Um, I'm not. There, think of all of the businesses that I'm not starting. Um, I haven't started yeah, an right. augmented reality related business, you know? Uh. Uh, so yeah, there, there are opportunity costs everywhere. Uh, uh -huh. The question is not, 
does the to paraphrase Cal Newport, the question is not could this have any benefit. The question is. Um, what is the highest benefit that aligns with the objective that I'm trying to achieve? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, and, and for me, um, I think you've, there's a lot of people that have a deep interest in this. There's a lot of people that believe in it strongly. And uh, there's a lot of people that do research on it, but of course there's that other subset that just are flocking to something that seems to be making lots of money and mm. uh, don't have the interest maybe so much, don't understand what exactly it is that they're buying or why it's going up so fast. But, you know, I, I think that this idea of, I mean, I've, I've heard people legitimately in some of these investing groups, and I mean just like groups that just talk about investing strategies, I've heard people say, my strategy is I buy Bitcoin, I wait till it goes up 50% and then I sell it. I mean, that just doesn't seem like a really well thought out strategy to me, uh, you know, but that's kind of the thinking that's going on these days. And that, that seems a little unusual to me. Mm, right. I do think that, all right, here, here's, here's the closest thing that I have to a, a, an opinion or a viewpoint at this moment. Yeah. If a person did want to get in kind of get in on the action, but not speculate on a given currency. The business angle of this is that in order to trade cr cryptocurrencies, there need to be trading platforms, digital trading platforms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And those are actual businesses. You know, the, um, mm -hmm. you know they, are the, they are the platforms on which these, these currencies trade and they have you know, very complicated code, very complicated software that powers them. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the fact that they have, there, there's this concept known as an economic moat that major, that investors like Warren Buffett, uh, Benjamin Graham, Philip Fisher often talk about when they're va valuating companies. How big of a moat does a given company have? Meaning how easily replicable is it? You know, how unique is the value that it's offering? Yeah. A currency, a cryptocurrency trading platform has a strong economic moat in that uh, replicating that software, that code, that's incredibly difficult. And so right. as the field of cryptocurrencies grow, any major institution that wants to, to interact with this, it would be better for, like if a, if, if a major bank wanted to to interact with uh, the cryptocurrency space, it makes more sense for them to partner with an existing trading platform than it uh -huh. does to like try to do it in-house or try to uh -huh. create a trading platform in-house, right? So yes. if you look, if you essentially want to invest in the cryptocurrency space, if you want to invest in the idea that crypto is going to grow in the future, that this is not just a fad and that 10 years from now, crypto will be a bigger part of our lives than it is today. If you want to uh -huh. invest in that idea, but you don't want to bet on a specific currency because that currency may or may not be overinflated, um, I think that the way to do that would be to invest in a specific trading platform because that is an actual yeah. business. No, I see what you're saying. Yep. No. Yeah. That like, probably like is Robin a, a good approach. That's a good approach. Exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. Like the Robin Hood of crypto, except without, you know, all of the negative connotations yeah. of Robin Hood. Right. So I'm going to throw something out there. And I, I think a lot of times what I say, it probably is too simplistic in general. But it, it, just to summarize with cryptocurrency, with what happened with GameStop, you know, with like just all this kind of stuff that's skyrocketing. I think Tesla was skyrocketing for a while. Still is. I'm skeptical. Yeah, I'm stuck skeptical of anything. If it's easy money. If you just see everyone around you making money and you, and you, and you're like, gosh, it seems like everybody's making money. Like I gotta be mm -hmm. fool if I don't get on, get on, on this. Like, is, look, I look, it happened again. Another week it went up another month. It was shot up. Now it's 10 times higher. Like I stay away from that. That's just a sign to me, right? Easy money. I just don't like it. I don't, I don't want to play. If it can go up that fast, it can go down that fast. And I don't want to take some large chunk of money. I mean, I don't want to take any money. But I don't want to take anything that's important to me 
and sort of this idea that I'm going to get rich fast, but, but realizing that I could also, you know, lose it all if for some strange reason it crashes. And I'm, now, it doesn't seem like cryptocurrency is going to crash. It doesn't seem like Tesla is going to crash. But um, at the rate that it's going up, it, um, it just it makes me very cautious. And it's just my strategy, which obviously is very simple, is that I stay away from stuff like that. Mm. Yeah. I don't know if that's too, too simple, but that's uh, my Rich Carey's simple approach to, to finances. <laughs> I like it. All right, mm, let's yeah. um let's let's end on that note. Sure. But Rich, thank you for um thank you for coming and spending this time with the stereo crowd. Man, this was fun, Paula. Thank you so much. Uh again, excited about the avatar. I'm gonna work on mine some more. Hope we do this again sometime. Totally. Um and where can people find you if they want to uh to hear more about you and the work that you do. Sure, yeah. So I'm at richonmoney.com, richonmoney.com. And then I also have a YouTube channel that's Rich on Money. And I think you probably all have a sense of what my investing philosophy is. Um, yeah, come check me out if you're interested. Cool. Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks, Rich. Thank you to everybody who's here. And uh, talk to you later. See you at the next one. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you, Paula. All right. Bye.